Hey, what's up, risers? I'm so excited to be able to come to you live from Dr. Brown's office. And before you ask the question, yes, he's read all of these books, right? Memorized them. Memorized, Memorized all of yeah, these yeah. books, Memorized. right? Yeah, and if you notice, a bunch of them behind me are in Hebrew. And so anytime I talk about a language today, I am super intimidated. Um, but we wanted to come to you because a lot of what I was feeling in my spirit, I think he started to articulate in some of his videos. And I had reached out to Dr. Brown and said, can we meet and shoot a video for our church and talk for a few minutes and talk from the aspect of taking the hood off? You know, we're in this series right now, Mask Off, but sometimes there's a hood. And I think the hood is not about white people or black people or brown people or Jewish people or whatever. It's about all people that we have a tendency to see the world through our mask only. And so, you know, you got a KKK hood, but you also have the hood of just revealing what's there. You know, the word apocalypse, and this is where I'm intimidated to say this, but that word apocalypse really means the unveiling. You know, when you go down the aisle at a wedding and the bride is unveiled, and sometimes we end up with a hood over our own eyes and we don't see what's right there. And I feel like there's some things going on in our society uh, today that, that, that really that's what's going on. We don't see what's right in front of us. And so I just wanted to have a conversation with Dr. Brown and invite you into the conversation. Uh, he has been in the middle of the culture wars for many years, uh, probably as long as I've been alive, to be honest with you, and uh, right in the middle of them and really being a champion for Jesus Christ. And so uh, let's start out with this. Uh, first of all, Dr. Brown, talk about the culture wars and 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 really, I think your voice is a voice of moral clarity, and you you advertise that a lot. But it's true in the middle of this murky situation we're in right now in, in America, in crazy season. Talk about with a voice of clarity what you see happening like in our our world right now as far as the culture wars. Yeah, it's wars. it's really interesting because there's there's a degree in which I feel like I've been here before. Right we're doing things again. Now, I know it's unique. I know it's a different time season in the world, but having lived through the 60s, mm -hmm. I was born in 55, mm -hmm. there's the old joke, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. So the 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 rebellion, the sex, drugs, rock and roll, I mean, the, 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 yeah. the generation gap, the upheaval, the shaking, the riots in cities, the taking over college campuses, just just a lot of what's happening mm -hmm. feels very similar. And, and even cultural commentators talking about Look at 1968 and compare it to today. So right. that's when right. the king was assassinated and then the shock and the uproar and riots in cities around America. But it's in the midst of the tumultuous 60s and mm -hmm. so much else that was going on, so much instability. Yeah. So the biggest thing to me is that you have to step back, almost mm -hmm. step outside of it to get a better perspective. Right. Because in the middle of it, you pull this way, you pull that way. And, and to get God's mind, First Chronicles 12, 32, the sons of Issachar, mm -hmm. who understood the times and knew what right. Israel should do. And, and I've often pointed out that one of the greatest issues in the 60s was much of the church failed to see the spiritual dimension mm -hmm. of what was happening behind the scenes. It's so good. And, and for example, I'm in the midst of it then. So to me, it was just flesh, party, drugs, rock music, indulge yourself. Rebellion, the older generation doesn't get it. You know, the older generation that says, you know, America, love it or leave it. We're saying peace, man, make love, not war. And, <laughs> right. you know, just dismantle the world as we know it, create a better world, a certain idealism. But you have uh, so much rebellion that comes out of this. And if you, the, the Woodstocks and, 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 and that whole era, and then radical feminism, and, and then the, the, the pro homosexual movement. and various things you know by by 69 so much of this is, is in full right, bloom right but behind that something else was going on mm -hmm. and and in the midst of the counterculture revolution of the 60s another revolution began the jesus revolution right starting around 67 and and it reached its pinnacle in the early 70s that's when i came to faith and so many others came to mm -hmm. faith radically saved in the midst of this so you say was it just god reaching into the darkness and redeeming it partly but it was also beneath the rebellion, mm -hmm. behind the agitation, mm -hmm. was a spiritual search. We knew there must be more. Something's wrong. Something's missing. We were asking deeper questions about the meaning of life. In many ways, the enemy hijacked that mm -hmm. and, and almost distracted us with fleshly, earthly things and mm -hmm. with rebellion. But when I began to write about the 60s, when I was writing on themes about Jesus revolution, right. starting in the early 2000s, late 1990s, early 2000s. I, I had forgotten how ideologically driven the 60s were, right. because I just associated it with rebellion and, and sinful pleasure and mm -hmm. all of this. 
as I began to read back, it's like, okay, right, there was the anti-war movement. Mm -hmm. there, there were these other things going on. And, and then I said, let me see if I can remember how I was feeling back then. Yeah. So for the first time in almost 30 years, I listened to some of the old music to say, what, what was I think? What did yeah. life feel? And I started to remember more mm -hmm. of the, the, the deeper question and searching. And then I grew up reading Mad Magazine as a boy. Mm -hmm. I, I heard it got really raunchy over the years, yeah. but it was it was the famous satire, sarcasm thing. Yeah. So there was an issue, Mad About the 60s, a compilation of Mad Magazine <laughs> from the 1960s. Yeah. So I went back to it and I looked at the 68 edition and there was one and it, it focused, it was a special hippie edition. And it said, you know, when you're done, you can use the paper, roll it up and turn it into a joint and smoke right, it. Right. <laughs> and and they, they had, you know, Alfred E. Newman, who was the face of Bad Magazine, looking like a hippie. And instead of the famous tune in, turn on, uh, drop out, it was tune in, turn on, drop dead. Hmm. That was the, uh, hmm. so I'm flipping through the pages and page after page after page about a spiritual search about yeah. looking for God, about yeah. looking for meaning, yeah. about Jews converting to Islam, Jews mm. converting to Hinduism, the, uh, New Age, you know, and a lot of them were Jews because the mad magazine writers were Jews, yeah. but Jews were in the forefront of the spiritual search as well. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, that's right. But most of the church only saw what was happening out there. Right. So I spoke with a, a gentleman who does a lot of frontline ministry on the streets, has done it for years, We'll take worship teams out. We'll go into the roughest areas and share the gospel. And he lives in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So when the whole thing uh, explodes with the, the George Floyd tragedy, they're out there on the streets. And he said, you know, we saw the accumulation yep. of, of a bunch of yep. fatherless generations mm -hmm. and people wandering, but without a father. So suddenly it, it doesn't excuse rioting or looting. Right. But suddenly you're, you're looking beyond what we can see outwardly. Right. And that's what I feel we have to do now. Yeah. We also have to recognize that in the 60s, a massive cultural shift took place. Mm -hmm. So that much of what was the, the extreme fringe of the 60s became the norm for today. So you had people like the Weathermen. Uh, they, they were militant anti-war people. Mm -hmm. They actually bombed buildings. It would mm -hmm. only be an empty building, but they would bomb buildings that's how violent they were. One of their main leaders was William Ayers. Yeah. Well, after he paid for his crimes, uh, he became a university professor and a mentor to, to Barack Obama. Hmm. Many would say some of President Obama's ideas that we would consider radical or extreme or way over to the left, you could trace back to, to Bill Ayers. Hmm. So the, the radical counterculture of the 60s has become the norm now. Right. When you had the Stonewall riots in 69, in June of 69 in New York City, and, and, and you had transvestite, as they would have been called then, transvestite prostitutes uh, protesting against the police. The last thing in anyone's mind there was that the day would come when the Supreme Court would redefine marriage right. to include same-sex unions. They opposed marriage. Marriage was this patriarchal institution, oppressive, that, mm. that had to be destroyed. Mm. The, the radical feminists. Mm -hmm. There was a group called Witch, the Women's International Conspiracy from Hell. <laughs> uh, really, that, wow. they were a splinter group. From, they started in 69. Yeah. And, and, you know, anti-family, anti-motherhood, uh, you know, radical feminists, many of them lesbians and, and all of this. They weren't, they weren't thinking, you know, just a few years, uh, abortion will be legalized and, and over mm -hmm. 60 million babies would be aborted. They weren't imagining the cultural shifts that would take right. place. So the other thing we have to look at is if we do not respond rightly and alertly now, mm -hmm. that things that seem radical, extreme, in, in some of the, the movements that are taking place today will become the norm in the next generation. So it's, it's yeah. a critical moment in history. Yeah, I would call that a trajectory moment, right? So there's these moments where it shifts and maybe the first year or two, it's not that big of a shift, but as the trajectory goes 5% off or 10% off, yes. you fast forward 50 years yes. and all of a sudden we are way off. And I would argue that, that with the, the way culture has changed so rapidly now and society's changing faster than it ever has, it's not 50 years into the future. It's probably 15 or 20 years into the future that it becomes such a radical, radical shift. And, um, uh, you know, we're in this place right now where, where if we're not careful, we're jumping on one bandwagon that's going to lead to another and affect so much else. And um, 
So, so let's talk about specifically, like, what is that that you're seeing in America right now with that? Right. So, again, we can't be reactionary. Yeah. Yeah. We have to step back, get God's perspective. So, for example, we must recognize the rise of mobocracy, mm -hmm. that there is a hostile mob, whatever the color of skin or background <clears throat> is, it is ideologically driven. Yeah. And is basically forcing conformity. Right. You must embrace our ideology and watch theology and whatever right. else, right. or you will be silenced. So, so we went from from we disagree to you're the enemy. I'm I'm good. But now I think it's gone to the place that that I'm righteous. You're evil. Right. And you must say the words. You must sign on the dotted line. Yeah. And if you don't, you will be canceled. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter if you have 50 years of service in the community and you are highly respected. Mm -hmm you like one tweet that we consider right. unacceptable right. Right. and you are canceled you are uh, eliminated we, we have to realize how far this can go it's been growing for years and years and years i remember oh over 10 years ago getting a call from a college professor a christian woman and she taught a class that was unrelated to religion and she said she is not allowed to say the word god she'll get in trouble because it's not her, her focus is secular. Right. I said, but wouldn't God intersect with this? That she was, it's off limits for her. So you're serious? Oh, I, I mm -hmm. know the issues. I remember uh, speaking in Florida over five years ago, maybe closer to 10, but at least five years ago. And after uh, the, the Sunday service, I was going to be driven to the airport. Uh, a couple of, of young couples wanted to have lunch with me. Then they're going to take me to the airport. Both of the wives were elementary school teachers. Mm -hmm. One of them taught first grade. Mm -hmm. And she said, if I dare raise my voice against gay activist curriculum, I will be out of a job. I right. said, you teach first graders. Right. That's the reality. Well, we'll now step it up. We're just throughout society. If you do not to conform to whatever the mob's viewpoint is. Mm -hmm. So, well, of course, we shout from the <clears> rooftop, <throat> tops that black lives matter because mm -hmm. many black Americans have felt our lives don't matter. Right. They felt we could die at the hands of police and, and, and the police are exonerated and nobody cares about our pain. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why, as they've said, friends have said to me, look, when you're campaigning for cancer, a cure for cancer, you don't have to say all diseases matter. You know, that's right. taken for granted. We're, so amen. We want to shout that from the rooftops. Of, right. Absolutely. We're standing with you where there's injustice, where there's negative legacy of the past. We're standing with you, but we absolutely do not stand with the Black Lives Matter movement. Right. We absolutely do not agree right. with with the radical pro queer anti nuclear family anti Israel mm -hmm. pro abortion platform. Nor do we agree with mobocracy. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is recognize now is the critical time to have backbone, mm -hmm. and to say where we see society going in the wrong direction. We're going to speak up. We're not going to try to prove how woke we are. We're not, and that yeah. that's self defeating anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, you you end up making a mockery of yourself when you when you do that. Right. And as I pointed out, you're woke in one area, but asleep in ten other areas. Right. You right. know, let's just be realistic. Yeah. But yeah. basically, there is this push now: mob conformity, a radical leftist agenda. You must bow down. Yeah. I began to say. 2004, 2005, when I started to research this, that with gay activism, those who came out of the closet want to put us in the closet. Mm -hmm. Now we know for your average person who identifies as gay and lesbian, they just want to live their lives. Mm -hmm. They're not an activist. They just, I want to live my life the way you live, Lewis. That's your perspective. That's their perspective. I want my relationships to be recognized the way yours are. And, and that's all I'm asking for. That would be your average person. Well, you have the militants, you have the activists, you have the, the leaders, right. those who came out of the closet, want to put us in the closet. When I began saying it, I was universally mocked, ridiculed. Mm -hmm. No one wants to put you in the closet. Mm -hmm. Then after a number mm -hmm. of years, it shifted to bigots like you belong in the closet. Right. So you're talking about in your school, on your college campus, in the workplace, mm -hmm. and ultimately behind the pulpit, your speech right. will be regulated. Your behavior will be regulated based on our standards. Yeah. One of my friends pointed out, that you you want to get rid of the police you're going to end up with a police state hmm. you're you're it, it's it's just like the 1984 uh, those that read the book or animal farm you know yeah. that the ones that that are the oppressed 
now right. become the oppressors, right. but even more harshly. That's what's coming yeah. our way. Yeah. So I think we got to draw a line that I want, especially I want our people to see this because it's a fine line, but it's a very important fine line that to say Black Lives Matter is important right now because Black people are hurting. And there's a level of affirmation behind, beside, behind saying the words Black Lives Matter. I care about you. I'm with you. Uh, you know, Jesus was about the least of these. We are about the least of these. So there's an affirmation, but there's also an organization. And the line has to be be between those. So we affirm people of color and we affirm anybody who's experienced injustice and trying to help them up. And we recognize it that, you know, we've had slavery and then the Jim Crow laws and all these things for so long in our country. And, and we recognize that and we, we stand up against that. At the same time, we got to be careful not to step into that next Black Lives Matter movement, which, in my opinion, we've almost lost this war culturally, if we haven't already, where the LGBTQ movement has jumped into the civil rights movement and kind of stolen that theme, even though it's radically different to talk about a skin color and an actual practice that can oftentimes change, as, as, as we've talked about before. And, and you can be you know, this one day and then change your mind and I'm not transgender next and all this radically different than a skin color. And yet they've jumped on that ship. And so with the trajectory that's going now, all of a sudden, as this ship goes this way and people jump on this Black Lives Matter movement, even unintentionally not recognizing that fine line between the two, we end up in a scary place where we lose our religious liberties because now it's hate speech to say anything against it which to me is that mob mentality that you're talking about. Now you can't stand up and preach the gospel. You can't say one thing is right and one thing is not. And it's not because we don't believe Black Lives Matter. I believe Black Lives Matter. I do not believe in the Black Lives Matter movement because uh, that goes in some really scary places for the future of our country. Yeah, so it's the ideology of the movement itself. Yeah. It's the mobocracy mentality. Mm -hmm. And then it's what are the <laughs> larger cultural forces that are tying in. So for many years, there was the mantra, gay is the new black. Mm -hmm. And I would have many an African-American caller protesting that. Right, right. And, and I'll, I'll do this when I'm speaking to a, to a mixed audience. Virtually every audience is going gonna, is gonna to be mixed in terms of, of ethnicity and skin color. And if I'm talking on the subject, I said, hey, I'm going to prove in less than five seconds that, that gay is not the new black. So I'll ask maybe this African-American woman in the front row. I said, please stand. I said, when did you come out as black? <laughs> and that's it. Everyone laughs. And that's like, okay, so obviously there's a distinction there. And then what behavior, what relationships are associated with skin color? Well, none, because skin color has nothing to do with morality or behavior. Right. And, and, and then, you know, the innate and immutable idea, that, that goes out the window. Mm -hmm. uh, and then even in terms of history of suffering, we know that, that gays and lesbians, transgender identified people have suffered in different ways, oh, yeah. family rejection and and leading to suicide, and some just get beaten up. But how do you, how do you compare that with slavery, right? And, and the right. Middle Passage, and 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 the history of of racism in certain parts of America. So you can't, mm -hmm. you know. So the whole thing breaks down. Well, now it's going further. Trans is the new black, right? And the transgender movement is now fighting against lesbian activists and feminists. There are lesbian feminists. Who mm -hmm. now says if if a man can become a woman, that completely undoes everything we've ever worked for. You have a J.K. Rowling, you know, the author of the Harry Potter books, yeah. right? And and she says, look, I have trans friends, but a a, 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 a trans woman is not a woman. Right. Uh, you can't say that. I mean, you you have feminist icons like Jermaine Greer that mm -hmm. would differ with almost everything that we're saying <clears throat> and believe as mm -hmm. as. Jesus following males mm -hmm. who believe the Bible is true, you know, yeah. and all that. She disagreed with everything. And yet she's been banned from speaking at college campuses, like in England, for example, because she said a trans woman is not a woman. So isn't the, it funny that those who are so tolerant are completely intolerant of anybody that's not agreeing with them? Well, see, that's the whole thing. <laughs> this is where the, the, the call for tolerance right. leads. I once reached out to a company called Caribou Coffee. Mm -hmm. So a national chain, not as big as Starbucks, of course. Right. They had decided that they were going to sponsor a local gay pride event in our city. And now the event's gotten bigger and all this, and everybody's behind it. But in those days, it was a bit more controversial still mm -hmm. about sponsoring. So I wrote to them and I said, listen, we're not asking you to put Bibles out in your stores or play Christian music, but this is an offensive issue to some. Here's what's happened in some of these events in the past. We're asking you to just stay neutral and not get involved. They said, oh, no, no, we, we want to stand with everyone in our community and so on. And I said, well, that being the case, we're going to be holding a rally 
that's going to be a pro-family rally, pro-life, uh, affirming sexual abstinence, affirming male-female marriage. Will you uh, sponsor, be a sponsor at our yeah, event? Yeah. Now, we, we didn't have it on the calendar yet, but I asked some other business people, would you get behind this? Just and they so jumped all over it, right? They were, they were ready to give money. And, These and, were their words. And, and contribute. We will not work with you because we are inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> so there is the double speak. Right. Because we are so tolerant, we are excluding you. Because we are so tolerant, we are canceling you. Because we believe in diversity, it's our way or the highway. You've Listen, there's the old saying attributed to Winston Churchill that mm -hmm. appeasement is like feeding a crocodile mm -hmm. and hoping it will eat you last. Wow. This is not the time for appeasement. Yeah. I'm not trying to appease the crowd or the mob when I stand with my black brothers and sisters. These right. have been issues right. that, that doing talk radio for years, I've become aware of that certain parts of the country, certain parts of our history are very much different than, than what many of us have experienced and lived with. And, and that even though I could give all the statistics and then someone else could say, hey, here's my life experience. Yeah. Here's my life yeah. experience. Yeah. So it sensitized me to listen and to say, hey, if this is a national moment to recognize certain things, like I, I didn't realize the history of the Southern Baptists because I'm, I'm not Southern Baptist. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that they were birthed as a pro-slavery movement, hmm. that they broke from the Northern Baptists because the yeah. Northern Baptists said, you can't, we won't recognize you as a missionary if you're a slaveholder or from the slave trade. So they hmm. said, fine, we'll start our own organization. Hmm. So, and then the first four founders of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, between them owned over 50 slaves. Wow. And then some of their great theologians, I mean, right into the, the 1900s, there, some of their best known people, 1950s, they were pro-segregation. Hmm. So uh, Al Mohler, who's been the head there for over 25 years, a few years ago said, we got to write our history and make it plain and acknowledge it. We're not going to, we're not going to remove these names from our history, but we've got to acknowledge it. This is our guilt. Mm -hmm. This is our past. And in 1995, they made a major statement and did a major reconciliation act. There's a lot of stuff most of us don't even, don't even know about yeah. many of these things. And, and, and yet there can be a felt trauma or a, mm -hmm. a legacy. One, one caller wrote to me subsequently and said, listen, Dr. Brown, you refer back to the Holocaust and the memory of that and, and how Jewish people see things through the light of history. Mm -hmm. So you see an isolated anti-Semitic act and you tie it back in with that history. Mm -hmm. Well, he said, well, look at our history in America. He said from, from the 1600s with the first colonialists or colonists who, who owned slaves, yeah. right? And there was always debate about it and yeah. an anti-slavery yeah. movement, but go all the way through that, now civil war, but then after that, segregation, Jim Crow laws, and then finally the 60s, now a lot of things legally mm -hmm. dealt with. He said, that's like almost all of our history. Now we got this right. little chunk over here and it's still not completely fixed. So it's something happens. Residual effect. Right, the right. residual effect, which yeah. is perfectly understandable. Mm -hmm. That's one. To the, the aftermath of, of the oppression, you know, what that's done to families or others. Uh, and, and then a third thing is, okay, the moment there is an act of, of, of violence, we, we don't know all the details, right? So we still don't even know with the killing of George Floyd, was that race related or mm -hmm. was the guy just mean-spirited cop right. or was some other grudge? Right. Either way, we don't know. It's a, it's a but it's horror. wrong either way. Right. It's, it's an absolute horror. But immediately the lynchings aren't that far away, the, yeah. the, the, yeah. the wounds. So that's great. Let's understand that and, and have the necessary conversations and be willing to look at everything. Mm -hmm. Are there systemic issues? Great, let's look at it. Right. Is there a victimhood that's being played into? Is the welfare system hurting? Let's let's ask all the right. questions. Well, I'm not fragile about it. I right. got I got no issue with yeah. it. But that's that must be our own our own call, our own movement, our own burden, not proving something to a godless society. Mm -hmm. That we're until we renounce Jesus as Lord, until we renounce the scriptures, yeah. until we renounce marriage and sexuality as God intended it, we will never please those on the radical left. Yeah. Let's not try to. Let's not try to impress them. Let's mm -hmm. do what's right in God's sight, get our marching orders from him, and then even more importantly, think of this. The year starts off with the biggest news we're gonna have in the year. Obviously the biggest news, the impeachment trial. Mm -hmm. What's gonna be bigger than that? What is possibly gonna be bigger than the impeachment, right? right. So that who even remembers that this was right, 2020. Right. It's like, that was, that was this year? Yeah. Okay, so the massively divided America over that pro-Trump, anti-Trump. Now the virus, mm -hmm. there's no bigger news than the virus, except the economic shutdown. Yeah. Well, then the killing mm -hmm. of George Floyd, and then the protests, then the race riots, everything. 
and each thing getting bigger. And, and now a Supreme Court decision mm. added in that completely rewrites the, the, the meaning of a word in a, in a 1964 bill. We're, we're just in June. Right, right. We have never, in my knowledge, had a year of this intense shaking in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the Civil War, you know, disastrous, well, well, hundreds yeah. of thousands of casualties and so much of people in the 60s in different ways. And, you know, the devastation of a 9-11 in 2001. I mean, lots of things, obviously. And the Pearl Harbors and the World War Twos and, OK, devastating times, but never a, a combination of different events mm -hmm. taking place in this short a period of time when we were already pretty divided already right. uh, in, 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 the, in these days from the Obama days down to the Trump days. So I'm thinking, OK, what is God doing right. in the midst of He's not sitting idly <clears throat> by. I believe he is shaking America. Yeah. Yeah. I believe we are reaping what we sown on the one hand. Mm -hmm. But you know, as a pastor, I know with a, a, a public social media platform and other things, this harvest time, right. more people are wondering about yeah. life. Yeah. There's more instability. And it's not that we're preying on that. It's rather now people are asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. Because being able to watch sports day and night or mm -hmm. being able to, to, to go to any restaurant any time of the right. day and night, eat whatever, right. that's not the meaning of life. Or all the yeah. other things that yeah. consumed all our... The distractions. Yeah, yeah, all the distractions. Like, okay, and so many people dying and, and, and death, just talk of death being every day, every day, all, all the time, every day, mm -hmm. every day. It, it's time for us to seize the moment. Press in in prayer. I, I mean, mm -hmm. radically. Because if we don't... The next generation yeah. is going to pay. If the Lord doesn't come first, the next generation is going to pay dearly. Press into God like never before. Cry out to God for outpouring mm -hmm. revival and go for souls, go for souls, yeah. go for souls. This should be a time of church planting and multiplication, mm -hmm. the likes of which literally we have never seen in our history. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I genuinely, genuinely believe we are on the verge of a great revival, but it's going to be hard getting into that place. It's not an easy place to step into. There's a lot of death to yourself that has to happen in order for the revival to come and a lot of stripping away in America for people to get their attention for the revival to come. And that's really, so, so there's several parts that we've already been touching on here, but when we say take the hood off, you know, part of it is, is the white hood, so to speak. So what's the unveiling to the white people? You've already mentioned it, but, but there's this residual effect that's very real, this residual effect that when it's coming down upon black people, they see things from a different light than the white people are gonna see it. And you've got to be able to take that mask off, take the hood off, and see it from their perspective and have a an empathy for people. And, and that's where we say Black Lives Matter, but we're not gonna be part of the Black Lives Matter movement, which sometimes is the veil, it is the stripping away uh, for the black community to go, listen, I believe that Black Lives Matter at the exact same moment that I gotta be careful of this movement that's going on. And then the, the, the other one is what is God doing behind the scenes in this? So right now I feel like we're reacting a lot more instead of taking action. And you know, like, like I can speak for our church that we've, taken action for a lot of years. And we've, we were speaking, I, I've told some people recently, we were talking about racism before it was cool. You know, right, right. that was like in our rhythms of things we talked about in our church anyway. Now it's like, we have to talk to it. But when we react to things, we generally don't act well. You know, somebody comes and punches me in the face, I'm gonna react. I'm probably gonna wish I would have reacted differently, you know, in a couple, couple hours. Right now we're in this moment where it seems like people are reacting really quickly. And because they're hurt and they're, they're, they're in pain. And, and I 100% get that. But the mature person has to step back and say, I'm not going to react. I'm going to act, but I'm not going to react in this moment. Take a step back and take a breath, because if we react, we can very easily get on this ship that's going the wrong direction that we're going to pay huge dividends for in 15, 20, 25 years and could be a, a massive problem. So so I believe with you that, that God's doing a, a great thing behind the scenes. I believe we're set up for it. Um, so what is like the biblical response to racism like like obviously racism was throughout the bible in all kinds of uh, ways you know even jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel and it seems like it took quite a while for them to actually leave jerusalem and go into all the world and preach the gospel what, what is the biblical response to racism yeah so racism as we know it is a is a more recent construct in more recent centuries mm -hmm. where okay where there was a, an actual ideology uh, or theology based on skin color mm -hmm. So, for example, that, that the Africans were more bestial, and that was because of a hot climate. Right. Right. Or the Africans were more sexually debased because they were descendants of Ham, who was, who was cursed by Noah. Mm -hmm. So a theology there. Uh, and then even a justification of slavery 
that you know they're debased bodies, but they can have white souls. Mm. You know they can be transformed. But a, a lot of it was racism that was more in the form of, of ethnic. All right. So cultural. Racism. Right. So in that sense, just as real and just as deep. Mm -hmm. When I had Professor Craig Keener on my radio show recently, uh, he's married to an African woman. And he said that what she experienced in Africa, uh, in war in her country and civil war and things like that, was an even more intense racism. But everyone was black. Mm -hmm. It was just a matter of which group you were from. Right. It, it, like the, the massive slaughter in Rwanda with right. the Hutus and the Tutsis. And so the caste those system are, in India, yeah. Right, right. So it exists. It's part of sinful human nature. The Samaritans outwardly look pretty similar to the Jews, mm -hmm. and yet the Jews hated so, the Samaritans. So would you be a believer? So, so a lot of people are not familiar with this term, and, and I assume you probably are, but that idea of otherism that basically says no matter what, if we all looked identical, we would find some reason to not like that other group. There's, there, there's something in our nature that wants to separate us from somebody else. So it's not necessarily even about looks, and sometimes it's not culturally. It's just in the human nature that you're going to find something wrong with somebody eventually and create a different, a different. Yeah. Group. So, so either their otherness threatens me. Right. It's right. what are they up to? Why do they do things differently? Uh, or it, you know, so if, if you have a bunch of religious Jews in your community or a bunch of, of religious Muslims in your community and they eat a certain way and they live a certain way, they dress a certain yeah. way, yeah. you know, there is something in human nature that finds it suspicious or, right. or threatening. Right. Right. Uh, there could be insecurity, there could be the pride of our ways, but whatever, it's sinful human nature. Let, let us address it as it is, mm -hmm. whether it's whites oppressing blacks, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, Indians oppressing Indians, wh whoever, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that is, is human nature. Whether it's Japanese slaughtering Chinese, mm -hmm. you know, in the cruelest of ways in World War II, and here you have Asian peoples, right? I mean, obviously different. All right. But to us, both Asian peoples, so that's human nature. Mm -hmm. and, and the gospel actually smashes that. It, it right. directly right. Right. addresses that. Uh, Professor Keener and I were talking about the radicality of Paul saying in Messiah, in Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female, slave mm -hmm. nor free, Jew nor Greek. That if you think of it, Paul gets arrested in Acts 21. And he's giving a speech in Acts 22. And everyone's listening. And how he's met, you know, this risen Yeshua and all of that. And then he says, God said to me, go hmm. far away to the Gentiles. Hmm. Oh, they start yeah. screaming. Yeah. Jew going to the Gentiles. No, we don't do that. Right. Peter, Peter, who lived with Jesus, right? They traveled together. He was with him. C could you imagine if any of us, what we would do to go back and be right. one right. of those, right? Three plus years side by side yeah. with Jesus. And then several weeks with him after his resurrection. Then filled with the spirit, the mm -hmm. most dynamic way in Acts the second chapter and preaching. So you've got mass salvation. You have supernatural healings, right? The, the, the man born lame in the third chapter of Acts. You have the fifth chapter of Acts where Peter's shadow, mm -hmm. Peter's shadow is healing the sick. Right. right. You have the ninth Amazing chapter miracles, yeah. of Acts where he raises the dead. Right. And then the 10th chapter, he has to have a vision, mm -hmm. go into a trance. Someone else has to have an angelic appearance. Right. Send right. a message just to get him to go into the home of right. a Gentile. Yeah. Right. Now, right. now, look, if that doesn't tell you that we can have our blind spots, nothing will. Right. I mean, that's Peter. This is the mighty apostle. Yeah. And, and yet he has his blind spots culture, background, and God has like, I just got this revelation. Mm -hmm. So let's be humble about yeah. things and, and, and not again, trying to be woke the right. way the culture is, but, but recognize that the gospel really brings people together. I remember I was preaching one time and talking about the tumultuous sixties and the, the shift in culture that took place. And I said, Hey, any of you, I saw a bunch of people my age, Mm -hmm. I said, any of you in the 60s into crazy stuff? Oh, yeah, we got, became a Buddhist. Oh, yeah, we, we took over a building on our campus. Right, right, right. There are two couples sitting next to each other, a black couple and a white couple. Guy stands up. He says, I was in the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> Guy stands up next to him. I was in the Black Panthers. And they hug each other, and everyone's laughing and smiling right. and in India. You have marriages across caste systems and classes right. yeah. in the gospel. It's very scandalous for the society. Yeah. The church has to lead the way. And mm. look, ultimately, if 
Christians have a certain worship style they prefer right. or a certain preaching style or ministry style. And you have mainly Koreans in a church here, mm -hmm. mainly African-Americans in a church here, mainly whites in a church, or maybe based on neighborhood. It, that's not a sinful thing in itself, just mm -hmm. like restaurants have certain clientele. But if we don't come together as a body in the city, if we don't work together as leaders, if we don't stand side by side at difficult times, if we don't really have deep wonderful fellowship across lines of race and ethnicity, then we are really blowing it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying every congregation has to be intentionally multicultural, multiracial. If they live in communities like that, wonderful. Yeah. And be sensitive all the time. I had one black caller and said to me, Dr. Brown, I go to basically all white church. And it was after another George Floyd situ type situation. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't expect the pastor to get up and preach a whole message about this. He said, but I expect him to acknowledge our pain and even say a word as if it didn't happen. That's what hurt him. Right. So that's where we say, hey, talk to me. I'm, I'm going to miss things because I only have my background right. or because I'm a male or because I'm American or because I'm 65 versus, you know, and, and mm -hmm. you're 20. What, so let's talk to each other. Let's, let's right. not take on a victimhood mentality or it's all about me, but let's communicate so that we don't offend each other. We don't hurt each other. I've, I've traveled outside the United States over 200 times. Mm -hmm. And you realize a lot of different things, oh, yeah. a lot of different cultures. Yeah. You think you're doing something special. You just insulted the person. Right. Let's communicate. Yeah. Let's understand. Let's, be, let's become sensitive to the issues and then say, you know, I don't have the foggiest idea what, it, what mm -hmm. the solution is. Right. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Let's see what God says. How can the gospel address this? And that's where if we can lead the way, the grassroots, Secular media may acknowledge, acknowledge right, it. Right. On the grassroots, if we can lead the way with reconciliation, yes. with working together, with caring about genuine needs, with standing for justice on local levels, as a family of God, united around Jesus, communities are going to see that. Mm -hmm. People will be drawn to that. Because ultimately, it's only the fringe that's drawn to the protest. Mm -hmm. Th thank, thank God for good, peaceful protests that get a message out. But it's only the fringe that are going to live on protest and then even a smaller fringe live on riots, live, live on vandalism and things like that. The vast majority want peaceful, normal lives, mm -hmm. but they just want things to be right and fair. Yeah. I think it's true that we're trying to solve a spiritual problem by a lot of physical you know, laws and mandates. I forget who said it originally. I think it was one of our founding fathers or somebody, but they said there's only two ways to rule a man from without and from within. Yeah. So you can rule by law, which ultimately doesn't work very well, or you can change them from within and you don't even need the laws nearly as much. And uh, and right now we're in a time where, where people are so egocentric, they can only see their own view and they can't even understand how somebody could have another view. And the gap has just gotten wider and wider. In fact, I bet while we're talking today, if you're honest, there's some people that have watched this and you're already offended at something he said or something I said. And if you're not careful, you'll stop listening. And as soon as we segment ourselves into our own groups, we all get a little dumber because we're only in an echo chamber of what we all agree with instead of listening to somebody we disagree with. And, uh, and I think these are moments where we have to listen more and speak a little less sometimes. And, and you know this as an apologist, and, and you know I was trained this way as well. You're not going to speak on a subject until you could argue the other person's viewpoint yes. on the subject. Yes. That way you can actually win the argument. But it wasn't about just winning the argument. It was the fact that I understand the other side so well yes. that I could make that argument myself and I understand my side. So these are moments where we need to bridge the gap. And whether it's Republican, Democrat, or, or whatever it is, bridge the gap and start listening to people we don't agree with. Even if they're wrong, listen to them to understand where they're coming from so that you know how to talk to somebody. And I think we all get a little, little wiser when we're like that. And, and thinking about, you know, Christianity is, revolves around this character of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of other things around it that can be different. We can vote differently. We can think differently. But this thing in the middle is Jesus Christ. It's, it's a university, right? Unity in diversity. We have unity around Jesus amidst the diverse cultures and languages yes. and styles. And, you know, go to Revelation. Is it Revelation 12? You would know, you know, where, where uh, uh, John looks out and sees the multitude and it's every language and tongue and tribe and, and looks around the world because that is the unity that you find around Jesus. And everything's not perfect. We don't all agree the same, you know. You know, you're, you're Arminian and you have lots of Calvinist friends, right? We don't agree the same on all of theology and all the interpretations of the Bible, but we agree on Jesus and that's what holds us together. And, um, and we just got to be careful. We don't become so egocentric, take the hood off and look at their uh, point of view, look at somebody else's point of view and learn from them. Yeah. And, and a key thing 
that you said is you were trained in apologetics and then I just kind of learned uh, along the way, you know, thrown into the water and learned to swim. Yeah. Is that, yes, before I can rightly address your objection, I do have to understand it. Mm -hmm. And, and the best way right. I can show you I understand it is to articulate it in my own words. Yeah. Okay, so what I hear you saying is this. Right. Yes. That's ah. good. And then the even more costly step, I need to feel the weight of your objection. Mm. So someone who's just in a terrible car wreck has lost his wife and three children. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't imagine. I could try, think what it feels like, but I can't imagine. I've never right. been anywhere right. near right. that. But if I know, but praise the Lord, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good. Not yeah. helpful in the moment. <laughs> right, right. So that's an extreme illustration. Yeah, yeah. But this is the costly part. Can I try to put myself in someone else's shoes and see the world through their eyes? Many times I don't want to because it's too troubling. Right. And, and when you're dealing with a false religion or a cult or something like that, you don't want to go their way in, in that respect. So you have to be secure in the Lord, right, secure right. in what you believe, have your strong foundations. I was watching a, a video put together. Uh, it aired on uh, PBS. And, and the, the producer of that had reached out to me about making it available to our constituency. And it was about uh, race relations in America. And it so powerfully conveyed the very real memory of the not so distant past. Mm -hmm to the situation in, in the world today and the open wound that can be there or how things can be perceived and felt. And that in, in order to help someone, you had to deal with that wound. Mm -hmm. And some of it, it was, even though I had no connection to it whatsoever, uh, grew up in New York City, racially diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, the, my best friend or one of my best friends, hard to remember exactly, when I was in kindergarten in New yeah. York City, was was a, a black kid, maybe from Haiti, Richie, yeah. I'm not sure. But there was yeah. no one thought about mm -hmm. anything like that. And then moved to Long Island, uh, started playing organ when I was about five and a half. My sister was like eight. Our first organ teacher was an openly gay man. My dad was very, very liberal Democrat, yeah. openly gay man. He and his partner would come and have dinner with us. Yeah. And then my next organ teacher was a black man married to a white woman. Mm -hmm. And that was still considered scandalous. And that, that was what, early 60s? Uh, no, this was now, uh, yeah, yeah, early 60s. Yeah, that's, that's scandalous at that time period. And my father was so upset, I remember he'd tell us, because he'd teach and then the couple would sometimes come and have dinner with us. Yeah. And, and I remember him saying, it's just, how, how could it, he said, they've lost friends over this. How could that be? Mm. That is so wrong. Right. So that's the environment I grew up in. And then for years and years in ministry, it's been multicultural mm -hmm. and around the world. And, and so when you think in a missiological way, you, you're not thinking about race and ethnicity in terms of barriers. You know, you think of a bigger family to have and, and you, you learn traveling. Okay, America does it one way, other countries do it other ways. And so mm -hmm. I have in that sense, no connection to racism in American yeah. history. And, and I'm Jewish, so I had ancestors right. come over more recently right. and right. flee from oppression in their home mm -hmm. countries and things like that. And yet, it's important to me to recognize how a white American could be perceived, or it, it may be painful, but if I can recognize it, now we can have a conversation. And here's the other thing. Once I've earned your trust, that you see I really listen, yeah. I really care, then I can say, hey, can I share my perspective? Just so you understand mm -hmm. what my life's like, because here's the deal. You'll, you'll have, you'll have an African-American and we'll point to George Floyd. So again, national mm -hmm. attention right after Ahmed Ar Arbery, you know, that shooting in, in, mm -hmm. in Georgia. So, okay, national attention on these things. It's like, you see what we've been trying to say? You see what we've been trying to say? Right. But then you might say, as a conservative law and order person, but I've done the research. I've done the studies. I've, I've read Heather McDonald's War on Cops. I've looked at, and, and, and blacks being shot by cops, it's, it's infinitesimal compared to blacks killing blacks you know, in terms of overall violence. Mm -hmm. and, and whites are more likely to shoot whites in, with cops. And then you've got white on white violence. And, and why are you making such a big deal about it? So we've got all our data and, and we're saying, you're just feeling like a victim. And, and, and then they're saying, you, you're thinking I'm making up my life experience. Yeah. You think I just created this out of nothing because I have this victimhood and, and we clash. What we have to do is say, hey, help me to understand this. Because right. I look at the data 
And it says one thing, but I know your life experience is very different. Right. Let's talk. Let's understand each other. Mm -hmm. And then even if we end up not agreeing on points, we, we end up agreeing on substance that you have lived a life very different than my life. Your experience has been very different than mine. I want to stand with you right. wherever right. things are wrong to make them right. If we have to go back in time to recognize certain things and acknowledge them, mm -hmm. or if we just have to move forward certain ways, but ultimately only the gospel is going to bring about change. Mm -hmm. and, and here's a big wake up call. So one of the big reasons that many evangelicals voted for Donald Trump, especially white evangelicals, was the courts. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's appointed several hundred justices and many strong conservatives. They'll be there a long time. And, and we've seen many, many rulings already, many across mm -hmm. the country, the result of, of Trump appointees that have been cases we think good ruling, positive, excellent. We're glad. But the big thing, of course, the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. right? He's appointed two justices already. If he gets reelected, could appoint one, maybe two more, transform the courts, right? Mm -hmm. And then his first appointee, not only votes in the complete wrong way, but writes the majority decision for what's being called the, the Roe v. Wade of the LGBT movement. And an absolutely disastrous, really, completely disastrous. Mm -hmm. I've talked to attorneys involved in the case. They said no one saw this coming. Mm -hmm. That's how crazy and bad it is. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, we just need more justices. That's not going to do it. Yes, courts are important. Yes, we vote. But for those thinking, if we could just get have this one in, that one in, yeah. I wrote an article where I quoted my book, It's Time to Rock the Boat, mm -hmm. came out in 1993. I remember the feeling. I was driving to, to my office one day, where I was leading a ministry school in Maryland. It was right when the election results were being announced yeah. and Bill Clinton had defeated George H.W. Bush. And George Bush was hardly a flaming conservative, right? right? But he had defeated George Bush. And I remember thinking, oh, we were so close, one more Supreme Court justice and we could overturn Roe v. Wade. And then, then the light went on. As I was driving in my car, it's like, you were putting way too much trust in the president, right. the Supreme Court. Right. Now that was 1993 I wrote right. this. So I just quoted it again in an article saying, we're, that's not gonna do it. Sure, we vote and sure we get involved and sure we want the courts to rule righteously, but that's not gonna do it. Right. The only hope is a massive sweeping revival yes. and the church leading the way. That yes. is the only hope. And then yes. other things will trickle down from there. Yes, couldn't agree with you more. I'm going to back up and, and say something and then we'll, we'll get close to closing here. Uh, so, so you mentioned something that's really white fragility and people don't understand that very well. But as soon as I get out of my comfort zone and talk to somebody of a different color or a different culture, it, it brings a little bit of tension in me. Because I feel like, have I done this to them? And, and so this is that white fragility. It's one of the reasons we don't want to talk to people, but we got to break that wall down. And, and you mentioned the empathy side of it and, and carrying their burden and feeling their burden. But I think the other side of having a conversation with somebody is that they become real. They go from being a straw man and a caricature to becoming a real person. And you hear their real story and really who they are. And it's easy to make an enemy of somebody who's you know way out there somewhere you never talked to. That's easy. That's a great way to make a divide. But as soon as you bring them closer and you talk to them, you find out, hey, I might not agree with you, but I still like you. You're still a good person. You're not evil as our culture wants to teach. I'm righteous. You're evil. You're not evil. I might not agree with you. I might never agree with you, and that's okay. But you know what? We're in this together. And so just having those conversations, I think, can be so incredibly, incredibly powerful. Yeah. Look, I've learned a lot doing Daily Talk Radio for 12 years. Yeah. And, uh, for example, I, I knew the horrors of abortion mm -hmm. in pro-life. You know, once I became right. conscious of it as an issue as a believer, yeah. you know, my, my whole believing life in that respect and, and outspoken and taken stands and been involved in different ways in the pro-life movement. But it was only when I would open up the subject on radio and callers would call in, mm -hmm. woman who had an abortion 35 years ago and break down on the phone sobbing, mm -hmm. one after another. A man who convinced his girlfriend to have an abortion 30 years ago, paid for it, calls it, I was complicit, Dr. Brown. I've been mean, sobbing. And, and yeah. these are forgiven. These are right, people right. who know the Lord, who know they're forgiven. But when you open up that wound, you realize it, it, it's that devastating. I knew it, but now you hear it. Now, now you experience it. Uh, the same way uh, when, whenever there'd be an issue like the, uh, Trayvon Martin killed by George Zimmerman and so on. And we talk about it on the radio. I thought, I'm going to risk it. Mm -hmm. And I said to, to everybody, listen, let's just make an agreement. Let's talk honestly. If you offend me, if I offend yeah. you, let's do it. Well, that, of course, deepened trust. 
But I would have caller after caller. Dr. Brown, I'm a pastor, African-American. I love your show. I listen every day. My family loves you. He said, I have to have the talk with my kids when they become teenagers with my boys and just tell them. A policeman comes near, you must behave like this. You cannot react or you may, you may die. You may be shot. And all the times they're racially profiled. Look, just happened in the Senate with Tim Scott talking about how many times he's been stopped. He's a senator. Mm -hmm. He's a senator. How many times he's been stopped and you right. get out of the car and for this. And he thinks, i got to be careful. And Lindsey Graham saying, I've, it's never happened to me once. Mm -hmm. I see cop car behind me thinking, oh, did I do something? Can I talk mm -hmm. my way out of this ticket? The, uh, a physician in the emergency room when there was the, the, the slaughter of, of a number of, of cops in Dallas, you know, a sniper mm -hmm. killing them. Uh, and, and here he is, a, a black emergency room doctor, doing his best to save the lives of these cops. He said, it was a certain tension I felt. He said, because in another setting, when I'm walking down the street, I'm, I'm afraid of what they might do to yeah, me. Yeah. Okay, uh, am I going to dismiss Tim Scott? Am I going to dismiss the, this physician? Am I going to dismiss all these callers? No. Now, others have called and said, we got to forgive. We can't have a victimhood mentality. And I know plenty of pastors and black pastors. And it's like, what? Life is normal. We just, you know, it's equal opportunity. Obama's, you know, was president. I mean, there are those perspectives as well. But I'm not going to dismiss right. all these people. And, and what I've even said in a multicultural church, you really, you can talk about social issues, but you really can't talk politics because it's going to mm -hmm. blow the whole thing mm -hmm. up in terms of we're voting for this one or that one. I said, but why not find some of the most eloquent people and, and that are voting differently and have a, a, a gathering where you each explain your perspective? Right. Because I have, to, I have to be honest, when I see someone, a Christian, voting Democrat with their radical pro-abortion policy and their mm -hmm. radical pro-LGBT policy and things that really lead against freedom of religion and things that I believe will ultimately be hostile to Israel and Thinking how how can you how can you possibly do that? But I know mm -hmm. I know that mm -hmm. that I cannot judge their salvation or their whole walk based on that. But my mind wants to. But then the other side of that exactly would be I, I could take the Democrat side, right? And we'd say, well, how in the world could you not care about the the widows and the orphans and all the immigrants coming into this country? And you know, how do you not care about those people? And that's the, right. And that's how could the beauty you of the how could you side. support George Bush with all the war and the bloodshed, right. and you care about right. abortion, right? Right. Care so more about the economy than you do about you know the people. You know? Right. So of course I will still I still hold to my viewpoints right. strongly right. and convictionally, but I have to realize I can't just put groupthink on the other people. I can't just think good. you're so That's stupid, good. you're That's so good. foolish. I have my reasons. I'm not part of white evangelical groupthink. Mm -hmm. Eighty one percent of us voted for Trump, but I'm not part of white evangelical <laughs> groupthink. I independently came to these views, even right. though I had issues with Trump. Right. This is why I voted. Well, what about my black brothers and sisters that overwhelmingly voted differently? Well, mm -hmm. I differ with the vote. Mm -hmm. I differ with the vote. But I'm not going to judge their whole spirituality, their walk with God or, you know, one one black caller wanted to talk to me desperately and was so persistent that that we set up a time off the air to talk. I mean, mm -hmm. this guy and he's a great guy, great mm -hmm. insights. And he said, you got to ask yourself a question. Why is it that that liberal Democrat that votes against the, all these things you think are important is an ordained minister who on Sunday morning preaches that homosexuality is sin and abortion is sin? He goes, you explain that to me. It's like, I can't. <laughs> That's, but in other words, and he said, look, you see all these conservative justices. He said, my studies indicate that they impose longer sentences on African-Americans than white Americans. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing it differently. Now, again, we have to dig down, look at the data, look at everything, what's systemic, what's imaginary. Look at all of that. But it's like, OK, you're not just a thoughtless person following the crowd yeah. and you see that I'm not a thoughtless person following the crowd. Yeah. Sometimes it's just a matter of giving dignity to the other person mm -hmm. saying we differ, but I see you have good reason for what you right. believe. Right. We differ, but I see you have basis for what you're saying up until now. I just assumed thus and such. Now here's the thing. It goes both ways. That's mm -hmm. why the conversation has to be twofold. Yep. But my initial goal is not to be heard. It's to hear. Of course, if I'm doing a broadcast, I'm going to get my message out. But when I'm sitting with you, my, my initial goal is how can I get you to listen to me? Mm -hmm. My initial goal is how can I hear what you're saying? Yeah. Once I've heard it adequately, so I may not have anything to say. If I do, I hope that I've now earned your trust and you see that I care. And now I can speak. Mm, that's so important. You said something there that's just, just so, so big. 
that we need to have conversations. Right now, I feel like we're having a whole lot of monologues. And the monologue, because of the mob mentality, says, this is the way it is. I'll have a conversation with you as long as you agree with me, which is not a conversation. It's a monologue. Now we're just, now we're just talking. We need dialogues, not monologues. And, um, but at the end of the day, the, the answer, and this is where we want to end up with, is, is revival. The answer, the answer is inside of you and me and everybody watching this video that's a believer. We are the answer. You know, it is still that that process of repentance and turning to God and bringing revival because it's always darkest before dawn. And, you yes. know, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And we know there's a lot of sin. Therefore, we need a lot of grace. Yeah. And God's empowering grace as well. And uh, we need to be people of revival who are torchbearers, use your, your terminology, and, and carrying the fire of God everywhere we can and standing up against this mob mentality at the exact same moment that we love people and care for people and are compassionate uh, towards them at the same time that we say, hey, this is, this is the gospel. This is the Bible. This is how we're going to live. Yeah. And our message is primarily not a race message, right. a right. cultural message, right. a justice message. It's a Jesus message. Right. And that digs deep into every real human need mm -hmm. and every area of life. And right now, people are hurting. Mm -hmm. We can look at the symptoms. We can treat yeah. the symptoms, right. or we can look at the root cause. So good. People are alienated from God. They're alienated from one another. Uh, it is a time for the gospel to yeah. go forth like never before. And if we'll do it based in prayer, full of the Spirit, with compassion, we won't have enough room to put all the people. Disconnection from God will always lead to disconnection from our fellow man. Yep. The more we as Americans get disconnected from God, the more we will be disconnected. The solution is connection to God. And it changes our hearts, which changes everybody a little bit. Absolutely. And, uh, so we wrap up with this, and I'm going to ask you to lead us in prayer, if you would. Um, so the good news, at least to me, is this, that, that the high priestly prayer that Jesus prayed, he cons consistently, several times throughout it, said, let us be one. Let us be one. As the Father and I are one, let my people be one. We need unity in the church, because until we have unity in the church, we're not going to have unity in America. And, uh, and so to me, the good news is that Jesus is praying for us. That's a, that's a good thing. That he prayed for us, and we know that prayer is going to be answered whether in heaven or on earth, but let's bring heaven to earth. So, yes. yeah. You want to say anything else or you just want to pray? Uh, the dynamic power of the gospel, the dynamic power of unity and the blessing of the spirit that comes yeah. is far more powerful than all the mobs, all the crowds, all the riots, all the money of the radical left or the radical right, yeah, so far more than any yeah. of that. Our answer is not hyper-nationalism. Our answer mm -hmm. is not hyper Liberalism, our answer is the gospel. So yeah. let's pray. Yeah, let's pray together. Father, we look to you as God. This is not just a religious routine for us mm -hmm. or a way that we unburden ourselves. We are looking to you, yeah. almighty God, creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. And we're asking you to have mercy on America, to grant us repentance where we have sinned, and to pour mm -hmm. out your spirit in ways beyond anything we've ever seen. The hour is urgent. The very soul of our nation is at stake. Mm -hmm. There is no political or earthly solution. We must find it in you. So we humble ourselves yeah. from every race and background, ethnicity, skin color. We humble ourselves and say, God, have mercy and pour out your spirit and bring in a harvest. Revive your people. May we grasp hold of the urgency of the hour. Revive us, your people, and then pour out your spirit on a dying, lost mm -hmm. world. And may it be a radical, dramatic harvest, and one that mm -hmm. will ultimately yeah. sweep through and impact media, and sweep through and impact our universities, and, and sweep through and impact politics and culture yeah. Yeah. and our justice system. Something we've never seen before. The mm -hmm. hour is urgent. It's not too late. We appeal to you to act. Start yeah. with each yeah. of us. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Yeah, let's. And right now, Lord, I pray that the veil would be removed from our own eyes and that we yes, would Lord. see that this is not just a national crisis, this is a Christian crisis. The problems that face America start inside of us. So, Lord, we just repent from any racism or bigotry or injustice in our own hearts. God, anytime we've had an ill thought about somebody because of, uh, because of a culture or because of a color of skin or something other, every time, Lord, we, we repent from that. And I pray that you would restore our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to what the Spirit of God is doing in America, to more than just watching the news, but I pray the news of the Holy Spirit would be imprinted on our hearts, 
our, imprinted in our ears and we would see it with our spiritual eyes. God, there's something bigger happening across our land than just simply uh, riots and problems and, and issues and challenges. But God, you are at work. And if we ever want something great, if we want a great awakening in this country, it's going to take us first and foremost being shaken. And we are being shaken right now. And I pray that we as the church would usher in a great revival. And so many people who are questioning uh, their own spirituality right now and questioning the, the deep things of life and uh, the existential questions from the 60s that were questioned and we're coming back to now as, as we're shaken in this country. God, let us as Christians be people with answers. And that answer is always found in Jesus. Our goal is not to get everybody to necessarily vote like us or talk like us or act like us or dress like us but it is to get us into a relationship with Jesus and lead other people into that relationship and allow the Holy Spirit to change them from the inside out. So Lord, I pray that we would be people that look at ourselves as the solution here on earth yes, because Lord. we are your hands and feet, Jesus. So we're the solution. Let us not be part of the problem. Let us be part of the solution. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.